Welcome to Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm Jeremy Yoder, and today we're gonna to be talking about the Goldie's Pit. Is it good, how does it work, and is it worth your money? For those of you who don't know, Goldie's Barbecue is a restaurant just outside of Fort Worth, Texas, and in the recent Texas Monthly Top 50 Barbecue Restaurants, they were awarded the number one position, and they make really, really good food. The folks there really know how to cook, and uh, they're kind of barbecue experts. But they designed their own pit. I think it was primarily Johnny White from Goldie's, and this is the pit that they designed. It's definitely very different than other offset pits that are on the market. The key distinguishing feature about this pit is the elbow that connects the firebox to the cook chamber. Whereas in most backyard offsets, there's just an opening from the firebox to the cook chamber. There's no elbow, there's no other path. It's just kind of a hole where the two are welded together. This one has very different airflow and it results in a different cooking experience when using this pit. Now we're gonna go through a walkthrough. We're gonna go from firebox all the way to the smokestack and point out the key distinguishing features. And then we're gonna talk about my experience cooking with this thing. So let's start with the firebox and move on from there. Feature number one that we should discuss is the firebox. This firebox is a 20 inch diameter and it's 24 inches long. So it's relatively small for the size of the cooker. And for most pits, that would be a downside. That'd be a drawback because typically if you have the super hot gases from the firebox entering into the cook chamber and they don't have room to expand and cool a little bit, then you have a humongous hot spot in the cooker and you want to avoid that because that means things are gonna burn or that space is just gonna be unusable. But because of this elbow design, you're able to get away with a smaller diameter firebox and retain that heat so this thing is very effective when it comes to burning through wood. Generally with an offset smoker, you want it to just eat through the wood. You don't want it to struggle even if the wood is somewhat green. With this, you retain that heat, you burn the wood in whatever way you want just depending on how you have this door set so you can alter the oxygen that comes in. So for me, even though the idea of having a 20 inch diameter firebox didn't appeal to me at first, after having used this thing for quite a bit, I have come to really like it and appreciate this design. Also, it's important to know that this is low to the ground. If they did a 24 inch firebox, it would be almost touching the ground. I think that's probably why they chose these dimensions for the firebox. Also keep in mind, if you have a 20 inch diameter firebox, that's going to affect the size of the wood splits that you can use in terms of length because this opening isn't huge. So you don't want to use, you know, 14, 16 inch long splits in a smoker like this. But then again, in backyard smokers, you almost never want to use splits of that size. So the firebox is uninsulated, which means you retain enough heat to eat through that wood, but it also bleeds off a lot of heat. So if you're standing beside this pit, you see the heat waves coming off of this firebox. So by the time those hot gases enter the cook chamber, they've calmed down a little bit. And so you don't have the same kind of hot spot you would have otherwise. And lastly, when it comes to this firebox, there's no damper for an air intake. Instead, it's just a door, which is actually what I prefer. It simplifies things. If there were one kind of critique I would have, I would say maybe having some permanent adjustments. So having this part that locks the door in place, extending out so you have multiple slots so you can leave the door exactly as you have it configured and you don't have to worry about the wind moving it and affecting your cooking temperature. So that's the firebox. Let's move on to the key feature of this pit, the elbow. Now, a lot of people online have said that it is the ugliest pit on the market. I don't think so. I think it's just different and it's kind of cool. And I just think it's really neat that somebody came up with a different design. Let's take a look at that elbow. So here we have the elbow. And when I first saw this, I felt something inside like, oh crap, if that's a great idea, ah, why couldn't I have thought of it first? But I think it's actually a good idea, but not for the reasons that you might think. So I think Johnny's reasoning for having the elbow here is that with offset smokers, you have all the heat offset from where you're actually doing the cooking. There's, it's not direct heat at all. But you can get a lot of radiant heat if you have just a big opening between the firebox and the cook chamber. And that's something you have to contend with in a lot of offset smokers. And so I think their reasoning was, if we put an elbow here, the food inside the cook chamber never even sees the fire. We don't have to worry about radiant heat. And so we kind of solved this problem. I think unintentionally, what they did is they really helped this pit out by allowing those hot gases from the firebox to travel directly up and then slowly arc over the airflow just makes it really want to draw air well because you allow the gas to do what it wants. It wants to rise because it's a lower density than the surrounding air and allowing it to go straight up at first really lends itself to drawing air into the firebox through the cook chamber and out the stack. And so I think that's an unintended side effect of having this elbow in place that actually really helps this pit design. 
One last thing about this elbow is that having all the hot air come from the firebox through this pipe before it enters the cook chamber is you have a lot of heat that kind of bleeds off right here. So the air that enters the cook chamber is calmed down even a little bit more than if there were a direct attachment down here instead of through the elbow. So if you see this weld where the firebox is attached to the cook chamber, it's simply that. It's attached to the cook chamber there. There's no airflow on this bottom part. It's just welded in place so it doesn't move. Now to show you how easy fire management is in this pit, which is not something I actually expected, let me show you how I'm gonna treat the coals and then add some wood and you're gonna see that it lights up and it's gonna start producing smoke, flavor, and heat to cook your food really quickly. So about 20 seconds for the first flames and maybe 60 to 90 seconds before it's off and going, we can close this door down to a normal operating setting. So I'll show you what that looks like. So here we're going to close this to about right there. Even though it's nine degrees outside and those pieces of wood are actually too big around for most backyard offsets, so it's not something I would necessarily recommend. What I wanted to show you was that one of the strengths of this pit is that it can eat through that wood, even though it's on the greener side, I can see water coming out of the end of it. This pit works really well at eating through naturally seasoned wood and wood that's even on the greener side, even if it's too big, even under non-ideal circumstances, this pit just performs. Now let's talk about where the magic happens, the cook chamber. A couple of key details that are gonna be important for you to know is this cook chamber is 24 inches in diameter. I think that's a great size. It's actually, I think the ideal diameter for a backyard pit really helps the cooking characteristics and it helps the airflow slow down inside the cook chamber so you have ideal brisket weather inside. Next, it's 50 inches long. So 24 inches in diameter, about 50 inches long. I don't know what the specs say on the website, but my tape measure says, uh, right around 50 inches long. Bottom line is there's a lot of space in here. Now, I don't think it's a great idea to get into an arms race about who can fit the most food in their cooker, but this has a lot of usable space. So if you want a backyard pit where you can cook a brisket and be fine, or you could fill it up with four or five, maybe even six briskets and cook phenomenal food if you have a big gathering, then this might be the right answer for you. But for me, I'm thinking most people are never gonna have a circumstance where they have to cook for 90 or 100 people at home. Most people are gonna be doing a brisket and a rack of ribs and maybe some chicken. And this has plenty of room for that. So this is a larger backyard pit, but it's not unwieldy. Let's open this door and take a look inside. So inside the cook chamber, we have the air from the firebox coming in through this hole right here, right at great level. So that's something to keep in mind. Now you've eliminated the radiant heat that you get with some other offsets, but you still have a convective hotspot right here. So it's not huge. It depends also on how you're running the pit. Like if you're running this thing at 600 degrees, which I've done just to see what happens. I've actually taken it up to over 700 degrees, but that's neither here nor there because it's one of the things I do to test is like, is a weld gonna pop? Is something gonna go wrong? Anyway, if you have it super, super hot, the hot spot gets bigger, which is kind of intuitive. But for most ordinary cooking, the hot spot is relatively small. It's kind of around here. We'll do some infrared shots so you can see where the heat's distributed inside the cook chamber a little bit later. But as long as you avoid kind of a U-shaped portion of the grate right there, then everything is gonna be barbecue weather. Now, if you really need to fill this thing up with say one, two, three, four, five, six briskets, it's not gonna be a problem. You can rotate if you need to, but still, you have a tremendous amount of space for a backyard pit. There's only one rack here because the cooking difference between a bottom rack and a top rack is pretty substantial. There's a reason why when you go to Texas and they're cooking huge amounts of food at a place like say Terry Black's, they get additional thousand gallon offset pits with just a bottom rack. 
The reason behind that is because they know that how a pit cooks on the top rack is going to be drastically different than the bottom rack. When you're limited on space, like Terry Black's is, you might think, well, why don't they just go add top racks to all their pits? That way they can cook instead of, you know, three, four, five hundred briskets a day, they could be doing seven or eight hundred. Instead, they buy new thousand gallon pits with just a bottom grate because that is the ideal place to have your barbecue, at least in my opinion and in the opinion of people who are cooking great barbecue in Texas. So, a bottom rack means you're going to have great barbecue weather. Also what happens is when the hot gases come out of the firebox, they come through that hole, they kind of rise to the top of the chamber, which means you have very gentle cooking on this bottom rack. Now in Dallas, I got a chance to cook on one of these for about 48 hours straight. And I was really, really impressed with it because we we're at the Cowboy Stadium. We we're doing the Q Fest. It's a big barbecue festival. There was open fire. There's all kinds of stuff, but I got a chance to really learn this pit there. This one, does not belong to me. It's actually one of my subscribers and he let me use it to review. Also, it's important for you guys to know that I don't make any money if they sell a billion of these or if they don't sell any. I have no vested interest in it at all. My only interest is in telling you guys the truth about my experience with this pit. Now, let's talk about this door. Now, there's some backyard pits that have super heavy doors. This door is very sturdy. It's made out of quarter inch thick steel, but it's not super heavy, which means that it's relatively easy to lift. So, I can with, you know, two fingers lift it. It's not that hard. Um, there are other pits. I'm guessing you guys know which ones uh, are a little bit more difficult. And actually, as a test case, um, I'm going to have my wife open this door because uh, for her to open, okay, let me preface this with the 1975 is a great pit. I own one. I absolutely love it. The door is just really heavy and my wife struggles mightily to open the door. It's like a 50-50 proposition whether or not she's going to get that door open. But Erica, do you want to come open this door and see how easy it is or how difficult? Sure. Can you do it one hand? Well, I don't know. Should I try one hand first? Try one hand. I did it. You did it? <laughs> Congratulations. Try it with two. Uh, it's just because you're short. That's difficult. Okay. So, subjectively, well, well done. Wow. <laughs> Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So on a scale of one to 10, how difficult is it to open, say, the door on the Franklin pit? 10 is difficult? Yes. Two. Yeah. Super easy. Yeah. Piece of cake. All right. How difficult on a scale of one to 10 is it to open a Workhorse 1975? 9.5. 9.5? Yeah. Well, fair. How difficult is it to open this door? Fair. I, I would maybe even go like three and a half, four. Yeah, it's, it's really easy. So I, I, I wouldn't I would expect agree. anyone to struggle with opening this door at all. Yeah. Would you? No. I mean, a three-year-old might have difficulty. You had but to start off with one hand. It was more daunting. Mm. So let me try it. Let me see again. Yep. Yeah. I, I would still say it's 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 got weight to it. So I would still say four and a half. Four and a half. Yeah. Okay, but. It's not insurmountable. Yeah, not it's fun. not a pain. I like it. I also like the look of this door. I like the backstops on this. This is super sturdy. Nothing's ever going to go wrong with this. And I like the flanges. It looks nice. It's kind of stitch welded and they've kind of canted the flanges so that it just looks really nice on the outside. Other features of the door. This does not spin. Some people like this handle to spin. Some people do not. It's a personal preference thing. And then we have this tell true thermometer. Now you guys know that I'm a fan of tell trues. I think they make the best analog thermometers in the business. Here they have a Goldie's branded tell true and the temperature only goes up to 400 degrees. So if you ever plan to cook hotter than that, you'd need a different thermometer, but this is barbecue. It's low and slow. The likelihood of you cooking above 400 degrees is pretty slim. Now when it comes to thermometer placement, this is going to be significantly above the grate, which means that the temperature you're going to read here is going to be higher than what's actually at the grate, which I think is kind of almost like a safety feature. So that if you're shooting for 275 here, it's going to cook on that grate like a big offset would cook. So for most backyard pits, if you're trying to emulate, say, what they do at Franklin Barbecue or at various barbecue restaurants in Texas, they might say, yeah, we cook at 275, 285 to finish the cook. And you might try it on your backyard pit and your food burns. That's because of the airflow differences in those big pits, the speed of the air, um, and where the thermometers are placed. What I found is that 
with this placement of this thermometer, you can pretty much run the exact same temperatures you hear repeated when people cook on thousand gallon pits and have no issues. Because all those hot gases are gonna kinda congregate in the top of this cook chamber, which means hot gases that might burn your food up here, but down at the cooking grate, you have barbecue weather all day long. Next we have the stack itself. So we have an elbow coming out of the cook chamber, but we don't have the collector. So on some of the other M&M pits, by the way, this is made by M&M Barbecue Company in Toole, Texas. I've been to their shop. I think they make phenomenal stuff. If I were to order a thousand gallon pit today, I would be ordering from them. If I ordered a 500 gallon pit today, I'd be ordering from them. You're just gonna have a long wait. I mean, I just think they make really, really good stuff. And the quality of the fabrication is as good as anyone. So we have this big stack and we just have an elbow coming out of the stack. It's kind of symmetrical when it comes to the elbow on one end, the elbow on the other end, and I kind of appreciate that. I don't think having a collector makes a huge difference, though I do think it makes a difference. What's more important, I think, though, is the size of the stack. This has a huge stack. It can draw tons and tons of air through, and then it's got this damper, and there's a really cool thing that they did to this damper. I think this is Johnny's idea, and it is a brilliant idea. I'm jealous that I did not think of this first because it's so simple and so smart and makes cooking very convenient. At the top of this stack, the damper has little tack welds and lines to show you if the damper is 25% closed, if it's 50% closed, if it's 75% closed. You can go in between, but it has those hard stops so you can be exactly in the same position as previous cooks. So if you tried 75% closed and you didn't have quite enough airflow, you can go 50% closed, allow more air to get through, and you can have that piece consistent. So you have a level of precision with this damper adjustment that allows you to have repeatable results. I think it is a great, great, great idea. 100% respect on that one. It's super helpful, super easy, and just a nice touch to make cooking for the Backyard Pitmaster even a little bit easier. And then if we look at the bottom of this pit, we have kind of a frame here. Uh, and there's not like a bottom rack where you can store stuff, but I found that storing things under your smoker is generally a bad idea anyway, so I don't miss having any kind of expanded metal to set small things on. It just sits out there and gets rusty, and it's just not actually super helpful, even though on the surface it may seem to be a good idea. Then we have a centrally located grease drain, which I appreciate, and then also with this, we can get away with putting the grease drain wherever we want, because there's no chance for the grease to run back into the firebox and create a raging inferno. So we have a big ball valve. You can put a bucket under there and collect the grease. And finally, we have these casters. These casters are made out of metal. It might not be everybody's cup of tea, but they're very durable. It's actually pretty darn easy to move this thing around, even though it's pretty darn heavy. Now, one other thing is the height of the stack. The height makes it great for drawing air, but if you're trying to fit this in your garage, it's important to know that number. So I think on the website, it might say, well, actually, I'm not exactly sure. But when I measure this from the top of the stack to the concrete below me, it's 93 inches and some change. So if you're going to be putting it in your garage, keep that in mind. I believe they're offering a foldable stack option. That way you can move this thing kind of anywhere and you still have all the benefit of a big, tall stack that draws lots of air. Now that you've seen the features of this pit, I'm gonna get my infrared camera and we're gonna show you some of the airflow and heat distribution in this pit so you, hopefully you can be as informed as possible about whether or not this pit is right for you. All right, here we got the infrared camera. So first, let's take a look at the firebox. You see where all the heat is in the firebox? Instead of that pumping directly into the cook chamber over here, it's going through that tube, that elbow, that's extremely hot, and then cooling somewhat before it gets to the cook chamber. So if we just take a look right here at the elbow, at the bottom, you can see it's extremely hot, but as it goes toward the top, it cools significantly. It's no longer white hot. It's kind of a, a yellow hot. And then by the time it enters into the cook chamber, you see the cook chamber temperature is significantly lower than the firebox, of course. You can see that the temperatures are higher in the top of the pit. So up at the top, you can see the higher up you go, the more yellow it is. And then as you go down, it's significantly cooler, which means that all those hot gases that come in through this tube are going to go to the top of the chamber and it's going to allow this pit to cook gently. And what you're going to see is that it's going to render fat really, really well. Then if we come over here, you can see that the stack is nice and hot. It's going to draw the air. 
Now, if we open the door to the cook chamber, we can see how the heat's distributed inside. Right now, we're just getting the outside metal temps. So let's open it up and take a look. So here we see how the heat's distributed. Right here, you have this metal tube that's conducting a lot of heat. Obviously, there's a lot of heat coming through right there, through that tube. But this metal bar that's structurally holding this grate together is positioned right where that opening is, and it's conducting a little bit of heat. So you might not have a whole bunch of convective airflow that could potentially be heating things up more than you expect, but you can have conduction from this hot metal tube. So just something to consider. Um, the heat's at the top of the chamber, and it's coming out here and heating up this metal tube. So if you're putting food on here, Toward the back or toward the front, you're okay near this opening. But if you put it directly in front of the opening, you're going to get hit with a high degree of convective heat as well as a significant amount of conductive heat from this big piece of metal. So here's the pit, just doing its thing. All the way to the top. pretty even heat distribution throughout the chamber, which is really nice. But now let me tell you about my experience with the Goldie's pit, okay? So I've heard rumors online from people who've seen the pit and, you know, they've heard stuff. Uh, one of the things I've heard is that it doesn't render fat well. Actually, it renders fat extraordinarily well because that heat comes out of that tube, goes to the top of the cook chamber, and as it settles down, it heats the top side of brisket, rendering the fat beautifully. And this is something that I learned at the Q-Fest in Dallas when I was running it for about 48 hours straight. So it renders fat super well. If you're concerned about bark formation, forms great bark because this thing draws enough air that you have to kind of rein it in and make it do what you want. That's why I usually run the damper 75% closed. That's almost always with very few exceptions uh, other than initial startup, I run the damper 75% closed because I want to rein it in and make it cook gently. That means you can restrict the oxygen into the firebox to control how smoky the air is that's going into the cook chamber. So if you want it nice and smoky and get really, really good bark, you can do that and the fire will not die. If you want to keep it pretty clean because you're trying to roast something, say you have a standing rib roast that you're cooking in there and you don't want it to be extra smoky, you want it to be high temp and you get a great crust on the outside, it can do that too. Uh, other issues, yes, I wouldn't put something directly in front of that tube. That would probably be a suboptimal outcome, but there's a lot of great usable, well, great usable cooking grate. Not exactly what I meant, but there's a lot of usable cooking grate that you can use to cook, you know, five, six briskets. You could do three briskets and several racks of ribs and throw a rack of beef ribs on there and you're gonna be totally fine. The people at Goldie's believe in this pit enough that they use one of them to cook turkey uh, at their restaurant. And for them, if they're trying to maintain that number one position, they're not gonna be cooking on something that they don't believe in. So this is something that they use, that they believe in, and it's reasonably priced. The uh, retail price on this thing is $42.50. So, there are other pits on the market that are five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000. This is $42.50, and you get a lot of real estate to cook great barbecue, and you have a pit that works really well. So I burned probably a cord, a cord and a half of wood through this thing, trying to get my bearings on exactly how it works. And so I want to give you a quick breakdown of how I see this thing and its use and utility for a backyard pit master. One of the most important things is how easy is this thing to use? And on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd give this thing like a 9.5. It's extremely easy to use for a backyard pit. The only other pit on the market that might be easier to use is the Franklin pit. I mean, it just does its thing and you don't really have to worry about it too much. But with the Franklin pit, there are other issues where you don't have as many adjustments to get it to do exactly what you want. With this, between the damper and the door on the firebox, you can make it do pretty much whatever you need it to to get the results that you're after. In terms of capacity, this has a lot of capacity. The TMG Volunteer has more capacity and a top shelf, but if you're in an arms race for maximum capacity, then a backyard pit probably isn't the right answer for you. If you just happen to be in a unique position to where you have to cook for larger groups, say 150 people or something, then it might make sense to get you know, a TMG volunteer or maybe even a 250, something like that. But in terms of space for a backyard pit, this one is right near the top. Next up, build quality. In terms of build quality, this is as good as anybody. So I'd say uh, when it comes to build quality, TMG is phenomenal. I just think 
all their stuff looks like a million bucks. All the welds look great. You can tell that those guys know how to weld and, and how to fabricate metal. Uh, this one I put right up there with it. So the, the guys at M&M, like if you've been to their shop and you've seen their work, you know these guys really, really know what they're doing. I mean, just absolutely top quality stuff. And this pit is no different. And then we have the price point, $42.50. If you compare this to other pits, I don't think there are any other pits that have as much capacity that are this price or lower. So you have a Workhorse 1975 that doesn't really have the same capacity in part because it has two grate levels and so you have kind of different cooking characteristics on the top grate versus the bottom grate. But if you want more space, you're gonna to have to spend more money. And actually you can spend more money and get even less space. So in terms of your bang for your buck, in terms of square inches of great barbecue weather you can have in a pit, this is really up there. So my final thoughts are, in the world of backyard pits, this one is on the Mount Rushmore of things where it's like, that is gonna be a great pit. I have no problem recommending it. If you buy it and you use it, you're gonna love it. It's a really, really, really good pit. Now, the design choices aren't my first choice, but I have to recognize that they absolutely do work and produce great food. So if any of you are out there considering this, like, I don't know, it's a weird design, don't let that bother you at all. You can make phenomenal food. Without reservation, I can say that this is a great pit, and if you spend your money on it, you're not gonna be disappointed. This pit looks a little different, but the food that comes off of it looks like it came out of a Central Texas barbecue restaurant. I mean, just top quality stuff. Now, a great cook can make incredible food with any kind of cooker, but this one helps you out to make even better food, and you're not fighting against it, it's kind of working with you. To me, that's the ultimate test, and this passes that test with flying colors. This is in the handful, about five pits, where I'm like, that is a phenomenal backyard pit. If you spend your money on it, it's 100% worth it. So those are my thoughts on this pit. It's incredibly good. It, it really does the job well. I was surprised at, at how good the thing is. At first it took me, I don't know, probably a cook and a half to, to really get it dialed in and figure out, oh, this is how I need to make it work. So for you guys, if you're interested, the door to the firebox I usually leave about this open and the damper on the stack is 75% closed and it just does its thing. This is my impression of the pit. This isn't the be all end all evaluation of this pit or all pits in general, but it's my thoughts, my genuine thoughts after having used this thing for quite a bit. If you have any questions beyond this, leave them down in the comments below. I'm gonna do my best to respond to those. And if you wanna see me get in another cook or two with this pit before it goes to the ultimate owner, let me know and I'll try to get those done as soon as possible. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the video, you can hit the like button down below and subscribe to the channel for more barbecue content. You can also follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and X at Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'll see you guys next time.